The biggest thing for everyone who has had either chemotherapy, radiation, bone marrow transplants, etc., is the fact that after chemotherapy or total body radiation, we really don't have a lot of information about reproductive function. It's limited as much as I've been dealing with this over the last 10 years. I feel like sometimes I have been the pioneer in just trying to figure out what's happening. Um, the timing of treatment for this is, is very, um, or t treatments that you have had or bone marrow transplant, radiation, chemotherapy, really has to do with whether or not it was before puberty or after puberty. As you know, there's the um, uh, a, a young adult survivor group, and there you have such a large number now that I have learned a lot from dealing with uh, those patients. And so that is the reason why we don't have all the answers, but I try and get as close as possible to giving you some road, uh, roads to pursue in order to find out where you stand. Uh, premature ovarian failure, of course, is the biggest thing for women. Uh, it's a concern because after chemotherapy and certain amounts of it and radiation, um, most of the time the ovaries uh, do not function any longer. And I'll have a sheet, of, I'll show you a graph on that. Um, men may have germ cell effects caused by the decreased testicular function. Their testosterone goes down. They have less sperm production or no sperm production. I think Dr. Witt, my partner, I just saw him going out and he spoke to some of the men's group about that. Um, so I won't spend a lot of time on it unless somebody wants me to. Allergenic transplant patients may have a significant pregnancy complication, and uh, we will talk about some options to go around that if needed. Um, again, young girls have a higher rate of ovarian failure the older they are at the time of their transplant. Uh, testicular function can be impaired with radiation and if they've had two or more alkylating agents. Women receiving total body radiation are at high risk for spontaneous abortions, uh, preterm labor and low birth weight, but are not at increased risk for congenital anomalies. So the bottom line is carrying the pregnancy to term is the problem due to probably the uterus, and I will get into some of that information in the, uh, soon. High dose uh, busulfan is a major cause of ovarian failure if given in the prepubertal period, and shielding ovaries during radiation may help decrease the risk of ovarian failure, but long-term studies are still ongoing. For the few patients that I've had uh, in my practice that have had this, they may have been shielded, but unfortunately, uh, after months and months of giving them estrogen replacement in hopes that we could um, have a good response in their uterus, it has not been as uh, positive as I would like to see. Uh, also, the ovaries that were shielded were not necessarily um, uh, kept safe. So um, I am not convinced uh, that just uh, the uh, shielding the ovaries is going to be that, that helpful. So let's do just a brief overview so you understand why I brought all this up. Uh, the egg number for women is determined at eight weeks gestation uh, with no further production during a woman's life. So that's the reason why it is so very important uh, to understand that once you have had an assault by radiation or chemotherapy, there, those ovaries are not, never coming back. And as I tell my patients, if I had a way to be able to make new eggs, I'd be doing great. I'd hand out that information the minute they'd show up at my office. Um, the ovarian function is sensitive, again, to chemotherapy and radiation. Um, exposure can vary, and it depends on the dose you received or um, the alkylating agents, et cetera, that, that do have a negative effect. Uh, the time of treatment we just said about puberty. I'm not going to go over that again. But options for cryopreservation uh, for those who, and I think everyone here probably has already had treatment, but for those who have not, we have been able to uh, cryopreserve eggs or embryos for the last 10 years. We've been freezing eggs for ladies for over uh, four years. So I've, I've had experience in 10. I am very pleased to be able to freeze the eggs now rather than making young women have to choose to uh, have sperm, do sperm donation in order to make embryos. So, so we've come a long way and we're very, very happy to be able to do that. 
This is just a graph to show is information how fertility does go down over time. The highest is between 21 and 28, and it's only 25% per month if you are normal. Nothing wrong with you. And that's pretty shocking information just in general. So we know that the, the reason why things start going down on this graph is because of the fact that the eggs are going down over time. And when I show my patients this, obviously they get the message. It's um, rather graphic. Uh, for men, again, chemotherapy can have a significant effect on lytic cells. And that's where the, in the testicle, the produced testosterone assists in sperm production. And I'm sure those of you might have uh, had Dr. Wood talk. He probably said that more in depth. But uh, this can be important for anyone to see their urologist and discuss possible testosterone uh, production and whether or not you need to have um, treatment for that. And again, total body radiation has all kinds of possible decrease in gonadal function. The one thing, if uh, you know of anyone who might have to have radiation or chemotherapy uh, for men, they can have their sperm put away. We usually try and do it as quickly as possible, just before they have chemotherapy, as we do with the women. Uh, the good news is men can do it in days. Women take 14 days to be able to put their eggs away. So for men, they can at least put um, quite a few samples away in a very short period of time before they go undergo chemotherapy or radiation. So what is the most important test I want everybody to consider doing? Um, Anti-mullerian hormone for women is extremely important. It can be done anytime, whether you're on birth control pills or not. Whatever day of the month it is, it doesn't matter. This is the beauty of this test is that it's new and that we've, we've been doing it for about three years, but the fact that we don't have to have you get off birth control pills, which a lot of ladies need to take because they're estrogen deficient, uh, we're able to find out what that number is in a relative scale about their ovarian function. Um, the level of 0.1 or less is not a good number. It ranges from less than 0.1 up to 4 or higher. The lower you are in the point range, uh, the less eggs you have. So uh, if your function is 0.1, we would have to have a long discussion about the fact that more than likely you do not have eggs remaining. If you are in the .9 range or below, you still have some options, but it's not time to sit there and hope that this will all work in the next six months or a year. It's, it's time to move and have as many eggs as possible to be frozen or utilized to achieve a pregnancy. Um, so if you are single and you find this out, we can freeze your eggs. If you are married and you don't want to have children right now or it's not appropriate for your treatment, then it's good for us to be able to freeze your embryos for another date, but at least to move quickly and not um, say we've got a lot of time because time is not on your side if those numbers are there. And for egg cryopreservation, just briefly, we can freeze late women's eggs but it's prior to treatment, and it takes about 14 days for that treatment to be completed. So we have a lot of, I do a lot of work with the oncologist. I see that patient the minute I can and be able to get all their eggs cryopreserved within that two-week period before they go to chemotherapy. A lot of them will have their port in place and fly to their, their respective um, um, uh, areas of treatment. Um, again, I've been doing the cryopreservation since about 2007, 2008, uh, but I've been dealing with uh, the cancer patients over time for about 10 years. So I think that uh, the most um, important thing also is the age of the woman. Uh, the younger they are, the more eggs they have, and the more potential they'll have to have a lot of um, eggs available. Oh, one thing I didn't say. If in these patients we will give them Depo-Lupron if they are not able to either take chemotherapy or while they're taking chemotherapy, which seems to help suppress their ovarian function and protect it. I've had about six simultaneous pregnancies after that. Even though I froze their embryos or eggs, they were able to achieve a pregnancy on their own up to the age of 38. So I've been very pleased with that. And 
If, if you ever have anybody you know, please remind them to take Depo Lupron every month. Have their have their oncologist give it to them because uh, that's extremely important for me to have six patients over a period of about five years to have that. I was very pleased. It used to be that you would be 28 or younger, but now we're finding that actually uh, even those up to 38 it's worked for. So I, I've been very pleased to pass that on to a lot of patients. Um, Egg donation, if you are young and we're able to go on and freeze eggs, our pregnancy rate, for example, in our egg donor pro program is about 68%. So the younger you are that you freeze your eggs, if any of these, anybody in here is doing that or needed to, it's just a very high rate if, if you are young. And I know I'm dealing with a different group, but I wanted to make sure I did that. So what happens if your AMH is at point one or that you need egg donation because you find that you don't have any eggs remaining? Well, we do have egg donation. We're now, we now have a, probably the largest egg bank in the United States in our practice, it just so happens. And we are able to take those women 21 to 28 who have donated their eggs. We do compensate for them, uh, them for them. And um, we have them go through an extreme process of uh, testing, psych uh, psychological testing, genetics, uh, seeing the counselors, and then we put their eggs away and put them in a bank where patients are able to see their baby pictures and get their information. We thaw out about four to six eggs, put those with the husband's sperm, and we have embryos of about uh, two to four uh, that they're able to cover. So I think that this has been a very excellent area for patients who have um, no other options uh, for treatment. And this is the in vitro process where essentially sperm and egg are placed together in a petri dish, not a test tube. We have embryos and we're able to put them back. And now younger patients can even do one embryo transfer with a very high rate rather than having a high rate of twins, which is in our practice is 35%. Uh, concerning radiation, I've got five minutes here. Um, total body ration, radiation is not conducive to ovarian function. We do not have good results. I'll just be very upfront with that. And the ones I have seen that had a significant amount of radiation, we are not seeing the pregnancy rate with that. What do you do if we've tried everything, the uterine function is not as good as we had hoped for, uh, then we will be able to talk to patients about surrogacy. Because the most important part, and you can see it right there, and I don't have a pointer, the red area, the endometrium has to be perfect. It has to be able to grow. It has to be uh, able to receive the uh, function of estrogen to be able to allow for good implantation. If you don't have it because radiation is unfortunately destroys it, then you have to have another way to be able to take those embryos and be able to uh, have them grow. And We don't want to waste them. So a gestational carrier is very important. Uh, we've been doing it. I've, I started the first one in, in Georgia in 1993. So it's very successful. We do it all the time. These patients are under legal contract to uh, carry the pregnancy, and they have their um, they they are under all kind of legal restrictions. So it's done very well. The Mary Beth Whitehead situation is no longer a situation because everything is legally done and we have many attorneys around the country who do this and the patients are able to get their name on the birth certificate a month or two ahead of time before the delivery so there's no issue about who the uh, pregnancies belong to and the uh, embryos are placed back into the uterus uh, of the gestational carrier and then they are able to carry the pregnancy for the couple. Um, I just will not be able to go through all that. And the men fertility, uh, just to note, uh, very limited unless you um, do IVF if the numbers are down less than a million. Uh, you'd like to have at least 10 million, but most of the time uh, individuals who go through this have a very limited amount of sperm. So we can still do IVF with ICSI, which was one sperm placed in each egg. And our, we have been doing that uh, since 1993 in our practice. And we had the first pregnancy in the United States. And everybody does it every day around the world. And it's, it's very effective in, in men who have very few sperm. As I told somebody the other day, I had a man who had seven sperm on the slide. And he wrote on the back of his little girl's picture, remember, I'm the guy with only seven sperm. So we can do a lot. You don't have to have a lot. 
but we can do very well as long as uh, we can get everything uh, gone through IVF, and, and I'm going to have to pass on that. And that's the ICSI process. It's in your syllabus, I think, with the one sperm placed in the egg. So essentially, uh, anyone who is trying to achieve a pregnancy or want to know about it, you need to see a reproductive endocrinologist and fertility specialist like myself, and we're around the country, or we're in every major city. We usually aren't in small towns. Uh, get an AMH for ladies, please, so that you can see uh, where you stand. It's a blood test. Like I said, OBGYNs can do it. Probably even any lab will do it for you. Um, if you don't have any function uh, but are interested in having someone carry the pregnancy or able to carry the pregnancy yourself, uh, then we have all kinds of options for patients. And uh, remember, radiation is something very serious, and we'd have to check their uterus and make sure and do some mock trials to see if their, their uterus is going to respond before we ever put any embryos in. So and a full evaluation is definitely something they want to do and make sure that we have all the information. Um, and remember that if anybody you know might have the need for freezing eggs or uh, sperm beforehand, do so and not uh, wish you had done it and be proactive for your friends or yourself um, that you, you actually talked about it before um, going through a chemotherapy or radiation because we do have some options. If you are not sick, that, that's a point for, the, for those. I know this is not this group particularly, but um, for anybody you might know. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop now because I know I'm limited in time, and um, we'll have questions and answers later. Thank you. Well, it, that's, that's a good question because the American Society for Reproductive Medicine does still consider egg, don uh, egg freezing as experimental. And I think what you have to do is look into uh, where they had it done and see what their success rate is. They, they really shouldn't, uh, I, we just found out because we do have very good success rates. Unfortunately, people are actually using our statistics to say how good it goes. Okay, well, that, that's good. It was experimental. It depends on the age of the person when they got it frozen. Um, Dr. Naj was very, very good at what he was doing. Our biggest concern at the time was mostly how many eggs were we going to, It wasn't the process, but how many eggs were going to be needed to be thought out in order to get a pregnancy. The younger you are, the fewer eggs you need to get a pregnancy. For example, we usually thought out four eggs for our 21 to 28 year old egg donors. In order to get in to get fertilized, we, we guarantee in those patients who have obviously been screened and don't have any illnesses, that you will have a guarantee of at least two embryos out of four to six eggs. I'm trying to put that in perspective, 21 to 28. The only caveat on that is that if the husband or the partner has an extremely low sperm count, less than a million, then it may take up more eggs to get the same number of embryos. And I tell every one of my patients that because when, when I discuss that with the <coughs> freezer eggs, I ask them to please realize, and I know you're not going to go getting somebody's count before you get married to them or fall in love with them, but just to have them have an idea that if that comes up, it will use up more of your eggs, possibly. And that, that's the only caveat that I do really let people know about because we found that we can't use... We have to do fresh egg donation in patients whose husband have less than nine sperm or compromised with Tessas or have extreme male factors. That's for egg donation. That was for our egg donors. They're the ladies who got screened. They came in. They're 21, 28, offered to donate their eggs. But it's a relative number. As long as if you're freezing your eggs, you may have a fall off of about 10 to 15 percent because obviously they are not
perfect. We're not screening them for every genetic disease, and we're not screening them for everything we do, our egg donors. But it's a relative number to put your hat on. I would not tell my egg donors that it's going to be sick. I mean, my, my patients with cancer that necessarily that's what their number is. I have to just give them that's what our normal patients are. So it may be that you're 15 to 20 percent less than that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. For egg donation. If someone needs to come to our office and use our bank, where we have frozen eggs, and these ladies had all been tested with genetics and counseling and lab work and everything else. We know their AMH is wonderful. We know everything. We put their eggs in our bank after doing an IVF cycle so that people can choose who they are and choose them for their donor. That's where our rates are, 65 to 68%. But... For anyone coming in to freeze their eggs, say before bone marrow transplant or before chemotherapy or radiation, I, I would say if they're young, yes, it's probably maybe about a 50% because I didn't screen them for everything else because I don't have time for it and we don't, you know, they may not be as perfect as these other ladies we have. But it's a relative number that is much better than if you were 21 to 28 years old trying to get pregnant at 25% per month. Okay. So uh, I, hopefully I clarified that for you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, first, I've been waiting a year for a period is isn't going to tell us everything. I think the AMH level that I suggested is the most important thing because that just tells me you're ovarian reserve and where you are. Um. We always, and I always, anybody comes back and says, gee, I want to get pregnant, I have to talk to their oncologist and say, you need to have a full evaluation by your oncologist. They have to give you the okay for me to let you get pregnant. I might even have you see the high-risk OBGYNs just to get their opinion about what they think. Because I want to make sure that pregnancy is as good as it can possibly be Rather than putting you in danger or having any issues for you or the pregnancy, it's if they decide that's not a good idea, then yes, you could do a surrogate with your own eggs. Well, it depends on what kind of treatment you got. Again, you have to go back to the chemotherapy and what, how much you got. Everybody's different. I mean, some people, I had a lady who had a, a very unusual diaphragmatic non-osseous sarcoma. And she was 26 years old, and I'm thinking, she went on chemotherapy for 12 months. And I figured she was never going to make it, but we put her on the Lupron. She got pregnant on her own two years later. So everybody's different. And that's why I'm saying you can't, you can't make a good swath saying, oh, yes, everybody's going to be the same. But I would get an AMH um, until they show that your platelets are good. And then you have good clotting factors. Pregnancy is not something you want to venture out to do because it is an extremely vascular event. Even if you had a miscarriage, it could be very disastrous if you were not in good control. So definitely I would stand the And you can get the AMH even if you're on birth control pills. So that's what I'm saying You can, if you're still on them. I would definitely just get that and then see where you stand and then talk to everyone and see where they think you are. And it depends on your age. If you're getting older and your AMH is lower, I would say let's let's go get some eggs or freeze some stuff and then let you get pregnant later or have someone else carry the pregnancy because time is of the essence. That's why you just think of that graph and say, yeah, I, I, don't have, I don't have a way to stop where you are. I would love to. I'd be a very wealthy lady and be able to do a lot of stuff. I could do that, but I can't. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, th I think each one have to be individualized. Um, they 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 can be suppressive in different ways. Uh, being pregnant is different than just trying to get eggs. Yeah, so there's a different. That's for us. We always say, is it okay for me to go on and do the stimulation cycle and get your eggs and make embryos or whatever you want? But the pregnancy part, that's when I say we've got to have everybody on the same page and you must have consults with everyone, see the uh, perinatologist and say, what's the deal here? Because we do have options if you can do gestational carriers and not put yourself in any kind of situation where you do have a flare or you do have some other things. 
you know, getting the baby and putting him in your hands is what our issue is, not who carries it. And and I try to remind people of that, and I know some people say, but I want that experience. Um, most of them don't remember once they get that, that baby in their hands, it's fine. And we, like I said, I've been doing that since 1993, and I feel very good about it. And I don't have anybody leaving any child on my doorstep yet, and I've been doing this a long time. Well, it'll probably be less than point one. I'd probably bet on that one. I could be wrong, but I always hope for being wrong, but I probably am not on that one. You know, we can't, you have to go through puberty in order for me to get eggs. you got to have your whole pituitary axis have gone through a cycle or two. Yeah, a period or have good... I'd have to get LHFSH and estradiol to see if you're making anything. And if you haven't put that cycle into effect where your FSH, LH is being produced from your pituitary and having a functional cycle, I, I can't, I, your ovaries aren't going to work. And that's the hard part. That's, well, that's good. Well, and, and, you know, and, and don't ever think you can't adopt. I mean, if I've seen great parent, grandparents adopt at age 75, you'll be able to adopt. Um, what the court's looking for is an overall package of who you are. Um, and that's why the choice of your attorney is so important because you're presenting a package. You're presenting yourself to the judge. And the more professional it's presented, the more, um, well thought out everything is in that package, the more you're going to be attractive to the court because the court likes to see children placed. You know, they're doing enough termination of parental rights in Georgia right now where they really don't want to have to do that. They want to put families back together, not pull them apart. And there are lots of options for you. Well, first of all, you'd have to get the AMH just to kind of give us an idea. And then what you do is, depending on, um, again, what your doctor says, the eggs are different, you know, as long as, yeah, I mean, you can do that as long as you have some, okay? And like I said, if I hadn't had 10 years experience in seeing some very unusual patients with, you know, thinking that they'll never recover from chemotherapy, even though I gave them Depo-Lupron for 12 months and still have a pregnancy on their own, that's been very positive. We're, we're in the learning stages. All these young cancer survivors never existed. They never made it to adulthood. So all these um, areas of, of question are still there because we don't have the numbers and we haven't had the experience. And we also obviously didn't have anybody asking us to do this before. And now that we have, um, you know, the opportunity, we're trying to keep keep record of it and be able to speak about it. But there's not going to be that many people who have done this for this much time and seen a, a, a good variety of patients. But again, I wouldn't, you know, you, you can't say, oh, I, it may not work for me. You've got to do the testing, so you've got to have the answer. And then say we gave you drugs, but it stopped, and it didn't work, and you didn't make eggs, then, you know, obviously that's the answer. Yeah, oh yeah. The, the procedure itself, as long as you're healthy. The only time that I have a problem, as I was telling you, sir, is that if you are very ill, and I've had some patients with leukemia and, and everything in my office, and I said, honey, this is, this, I cannot see that you are physically able to go through a two-week procedure of doing this every day. It's a two, two shots a day, ultrasounds, blood work, and then a procedure to remove the eggs in a, in a 10 to 12 day period. I said, you're not going to make it. And, and you're not physically able to do that. And I don't have enough white count here to make sure that I don't cause you infection. So everybody's different, and that's why we have to individualize everybody. Um, some have, actually. Um, I've had a few. Um, you know, because we write down that it's got to do with cancer. I, when I have patients, and my practice has been very kind, we get the drug companies to give us the drugs, and our practice has done egg, just before chemotherapy. It, it has to be before chemo or radiation. We actually will charge only cost and will not make any money on it. And we've been doing that 10 years. But after we have to, but we try and write it up 
you know, that the patient has had that and we put it in and we work every way we can. We have eight people in our office that do nothing but insurance advising. And we try in every way we can. Now there's the um, foundation, um, uh, not the Lance Armstrong because he takes care of it. Well, but he's, yeah, they put it over that. But we have a, a, a group up in New York that Fertile Hope. And sometimes if you have, uh, don't make enough money, they will help you out. So it depends on your financial status, and some of them will give you some money, which is great. So we work on whatever we can, and, and in those patients, we'll say, you know, you don't have to come up with all the money up front. Maybe you can pay it over time or something. We try and work with patients. Yeah. For, for an in vitro cycle, uh, sometimes if I can get the drug, I can save people about three to $4,000. That's just the drug. Uh, and the IVF is somewhere between 10 and 12. Yeah, that's, you know, the the hard part just in general for people, um, most of the the young kids after they got their chemo, radio, mostly chemo, they're going to be put on birth control pills because their period stopped. So you don't know. That's why the beauty of this AMH is that you don't have to come off of it and go into having hot flashes and night sweats, which we don't want people to do. We want you to be able to get your AMH. So all you got to do is get the test. And you don't have to come off for two months, which we used to have to tell people to do. So I would just say you could get your oncologist, your uh, you can get your GP, anybody who can write anti-mullerian hormone, <laughs> that's what you need. And you can just go in and get it any time. doesn't have to be fasting. doesn't give me in the middle of the afternoon. It doesn't matter. Yeah, remember the lesson point one is the lowest. But if you have it up in the point range, I've even had a lady the other day had, uh, I think hers was 0. 0.6, and I got like five eggs from her. But the lower that number gets in the point range, the less eggs I'm going to have. Well, yeah, they, they haven't really, we haven't been able to have enough patients to be able to do genetics on all of them. But the ladies who have been on chemotherapy and been through everything and now have had children, every one of them is fine. So I have at least six that I know of that actually they they went through the whole thing and got pregnant on their own after I gave them the Lupron and, and said, yes, I have children. I have a child. The younger you are, the better it is. And I do tell people if you were young and had this treatment, the average age of going into menopause, if you still have eggs, is around 28 or ovarian failure. So I tell people, please have your testing done early so we have a chance that we can find out if you've got eggs to retrieve. Um, so 28 is that magic number that has been around, but obviously we're going to have to do a lot more testing and get more information to be able to give you an absolute answer, but we're not. it's going to be a while yet. Yeah, I mean, the, it just depends. There are some alkylating agents that are just devastating to ovaries. And everybody's different because you get everybody gets a different dose and nobody's the same. And that's why I say everything has to be individualized and never take it as a swath of just because I had this, it's not going to work for me. That's why you have to just say, I'm, I'm an individual, I'll see what I have and we can see what you can do. No, no, don't take it. Make yourself feel better. Yeah, don't, don't hold back. That's, don't need to do that. That that's not going to help you. I mean, make yourself feel better. Waiting a year, you can come on. Wait, you know, give yourself medication. Maybe nine months from now, okay, stop the pills and let's see what happens. And do I come back on my own? Yeah, just take your. I I would I would take something. Thank you so much for coming to this workshop, and let's give our presenters another round of applause. Thank you.